We ready? Wonderful. So welcome everyone to our second panel of the day. This is retaining seasonal staff from year to year. Um, I'm Caroline Rideout. I'm the Workforce Development Specialist with the Maine Tourism Association. Um, this organization uh, is sort of our, our baby. Kat and, and myself put this together um, and we're very excited to see all of you here. So welcome. And I would also like to welcome our four panelists. Um, let's go ahead and just have the four of you introduce yourselves and briefly explain your organization and its connection to the tourism and hospitality industry. Annie, you want to start us off? Sure. So I'm Annie Maley, and my husband and I ran one of the main wind jammers, the schooner Janie Riggin, for 20, owned and ran for 23 years, and we're in the business before that. I now own a business that is um, like a uh, tourism adjacent called the Georges River Canvas, which is a, um, a marine canvas um, sewing business. So I support that industry plus all of the um, sailboats and you know marine folks that are coming to our area over the course of the summer. And how did the J&E Riggin, uh, how was that connected to seasonal employment? Uh, completely. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we run our seasons from um, the actual work in, with guests. It's a hospitality industry. We take guests sailing from May through the middle of October, and um, and then the kind of nine to five work starts once the actual seasonality of our our trips is over. The business I have now is much more um, year-round. Kate? Uh, my name is Kate Morris. I'm the regional executive pastry chef for My Guest Hotel Group. Um, that is my seasonal job in the summer season and in the winter season. Um, I am the recruiting manager for all 11 properties. My Guest Hotel Group is a um, hospitality management group that owns and or operates um, boutique hotels and resorts around New England. And uh, Jenny? I'm Jenny Wilty McClure. I'm the Human Resources Training and Recruiting Manager for Sugarloaf Mountain. Uh, Sugarloaf is traditionally known as a skiing and snowboarding resort in northwestern Maine, uh, but we're definitely building into more of a maybe three, not quite four season resort yet. Um, and we're also part of Boyne Resorts Family, which has 10 resorts nationwide and one in Canada, and we all are deeply involved with seasonal employment at all of those resorts. And Carly. Hi everyone, I'm Carly Eglin. I am the co-founder and COO at Seasonal Connect. Um, and Seasonal Connect is a platform and a community for seasonal employers to find staff and um, solve their operational needs. So um, there's seasonal workers in there as well and they can post jobs that the seasonal workers can mm -hmm. apply to. Um, and there's also employer to employer recruiting. So the winter season employers and the summer season employers um, partner to recruit staff back and forth. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Definitely needed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so my first question is actually for all of you. Um, I'm sure that you have your different impressions. But uh, to start, what are some of the challenges that face tourism businesses in terms of employment, especially in the realm of seasonal employment? And whoever would like to begin? Carly, do you want to start? Sure. I mean, I think we're seeing a decline in interest in working in the hospitality and tourism industry, from especially from younger um, people. We're seeing that students are not enrolling in quite the same numbers. Um, and then I would say worker retention as well. I think um, people are having a really hard time, especially with seasonal workers, getting them to come back year after year, um, which is a challenge. So um, that's what I would say there. Yeah, I can jump in. Um, we, we kind of have it on a twofold challenge. We do have our functional challenges of having employees come back, um, providing housing for employees, uh, we're also in the outdoor recreation industry, so weather is a big factor for us, uh, as well as guest volume. Um, we also have that guest-facing piece, too, that if we don't have enough staff, we can't provide the resources, and then it's just an endless cycle um, that we have been able to stay ahead of and break, but it's definitely there looming if, if we don't have the luck that we've had. Before we go to Kate, sorry, I would be very curious how you've managed to stay ahead of that. 
Um, we at Sugarloaf are super lucky. Uh, it, we just have a really unique culture um, and it's a fun place to be. So we try to lean on that as much as we can. And that has pretty much been successful so far. We are also really fortunate to be in the outdoor industry through 2020 because we didn't have to close all of our doors. Um, and we actually saw an influx in guests due to that. Kate? Uh, so with us, we have, we're seasonal, so we have a lot of younger people on our crew, and then we have a lot of people who, you know, kids have moved out of the house, and they just want something to fill their time here and there in the summer, and that's our core crew of staff. Um, so for us, it's finding people in the middle of, of the road of life um, to get jobs with us, and I think that part of that um, is the stigma of hospitality being a career, and that's something that we really try and focus on, is that it can be a career. Yeah, for us, I think we're a little bit more in the in your realm with uh, because it's such an interesting thing that um, and such an attractive, adventurous thing to do. So word of mouth was um, always a big deal to us. I, for us, our biggest challenge was the remaining like uh, keeping our. Um, compensation at a place that was attractive and still um, remaining profitable, you know, always looking to both of those pieces. Um, in addition to, I mean, we share all of these other challenges as well, but I think that's an additional one that um, I think spans hospitality, to be honest. And Annie, both you and um, Jenny bring up a really great point of, and you guys don't have to look at me, I'm sorry. <laughs> look back at me and I'm like, I'm, I'm the voice back here. Uh, I'm, I'm um, so you brought up a good point that uh, your businesses have an allure of being a bit of an adventure. And one thing I'd like to sort of ask of all of you is, especially for those of you whose businesses might not be quote unquote an adventure, how can you give it, like what's what's a, an approach that you can do to give it that appeal? Um, and it, that can be from Annie and Jenny, what are some suggestions that you might have um, for our audience here on how to make your business seem a bit more uh, adventurous, I suppose, or, or have that draw um, and Kate, if, if you got some thoughts as well, I don't know, you were <laughs> sort of, but what, what do y'all think? Um, I think we're also really fortunate in that part of our culture is this family feel. Mm -hmm. um, that's a big push for our, our mission is to make guests feel like they're home. Uh, and that's for our team members and for our employees both. Uh, so we do have that added value of being a ski resort and getting some great perks, but we have a lot of team members that don't ski. So we need to keep that in mind. Um, and that family feel really does it for us, uh, making people be excited about coming to work because they like the people that they work with or knowing that if they have a problem with someone that they work with, there's someone that they trust that they can go to to talk about it. So the family aspect is really helpful too. Yeah, I would just say to piggyback on that, our culture is incredibly important um, and how we treat our staff within that culture is incredibly important. It's pretty much everything, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, like you're it, like, so we, I just attended the <clears throat> uh, session prior where they were talking about internships and how the internships are a feeder into um, more long-term jobs, but I think that's true from a seasonal perspective as well. So we had an internship program, an apprentice program within our company, and then, but the thing is, in every aspect, your interactions with your team is what's, all of those interactions are what's building on them either deciding to come back or not. And a big part of that is it's partly the job, but even I think even more than the job, it's how do they feel about waking up in the morning and going to work? Um, it doesn't hurt if it's out on a sailboat. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll say too, um, I know you were talking about just talking about it as if it's an adventure. Um, our One of the challenges that we face in finding the workers is 
um, marketing to them. And so when we were doing social media campaigns, we actually found that if you say seasonal adventure instead of seasonal job, people respond to that. And it's mm. something that they are more likely to look at, click on, and engage with. So there's definitely something to it. Right. Semantics definitely play a part, the word choice and how it's advertised. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And actually, going back to something that you, the separate look you said, is um, building that family community type of experience. Um, that doesn't happen overnight. That takes coming at it from different angles. And I'm wondering, can any of you expand on how um, you were able to build that sort of familial spirit within your business, um, whether it's you know the drama or uh, providing housing? I mean, it can be something very tangible, or it can be more of a, a personal experience. Um, I would say for our company, you know, we know we're seasonal. We know that we have a large group that's coming back year to year, but we also have a ton of people who this is the first time in Maine. This is the first time in the woods. This is the first time at a hotel. Um, and so we always try and create experiences for them. We'll let them know about like, hey, the Freiburg Fair is coming up. We're all going. Do you want to come? And we try and coordinate those things with people's days off have a couple of different sessions so that a lot of people can go. Um, we also do a big bowling party at the beginning of the season just to kind of get everybody a little bit more comfortable with each other. You know, I'm going to make a fool of myself bowling, but that's fine. I'll see you at work the next day. Um, you know, so we try and create these situations where you get to see the people that you work with not in that setting. Um, and I think that it really kind of helps build and foster those relationships. Um, another thing that we do is we have holiday parties even when we're not open for the season hey, if you happen to be in the area or in town, come on over and we're going to hang out and celebrate the season. Um, and so it's just another touch point to keep that bond and those relationships together. I think for us, our experience um, is that our employees uh, were from the ages of around 18 to 24, 25, primarily. So we always, it, it's a little bit like they were coming to us for like adult finishing school in a way, in this adventure realm. So when we talk about family and like workforce development, it really was, and we're working shoulder to shoulder with them all the time. So anybody who has um, an outdoor adventure um, business. This is this applies to them much more than it might to something where folks are going home at the end of the day. Like we're living with each other, yeah. so it feels more like family. And and yet there still needs to be. You can't use that word too much because it becomes that stops being authentic after a while. Because you also want to have that professionalism um, that remains. The other thing um, for us is that it's we're a husband and wife team. So already there's more family, a family aspect. And then um, we raised our, our two girls on the boat as well. So our team was inter was literally interwoven with our family. And then, um, and then the connections, you know, how they came to us was sometimes just one step removed, meaning that they are, you know, kids of friends of ours, etc. So um, we found, especially with that age group, that um, the interacting with them is very, while it's very personal, there's also a level of um, expect, like really clear expectations, like you would with your budding adult children. That all, all of those muscles of um, being a boss to these young adults felt the same, like the same muscles that I used as a mom. It's not the same but the same kind of really clear expectations, kind but firm um, boundaries, all of that really worked well for us with our, with our team. Um, you know, it, it's a much more informal workplace than potentially um, what these guys have. Yeah, and just building on what Annie said, the family piece can be tough and you do want it to be authentic. And we're a really big company in the winter. Hopefully we'll have 850 to 900 employees. So 
other than the fact that I've already processed their onboarding paperwork and I can freak people out because I know their name, they wear name tags. And we encourage everyone to use that. When you see someone and they have a name tag on, use their name. It's, it's right there for you. Um, and it's amazing what that can do. It just makes someone feel seen and they then do have that family feel even though they don't even know who that person was that just walked by. Mm. Uh, that really helps. Um, another tool that we have found to be incredibly useful all across the Boeing resorts is twice a year we give all of our team members a team member engagement survey just to kind of get a pulse for how we're doing. It's the same 20 questions every time. But we use that data and in our trainings in the fall, we bring the data up and we talk about the changes that we've made because of it. So even though we're not letting you know, Sarah and guest services know that we heard what you had to say because it's an anonymous survey, so that's nice that they could do that. We are saying we made some changes because of the results of our team member engagement survey, so they, our team feels heard, and that's really helpful. The other thing that I've heard, too, from the people that we work with is connecting with the, your staff during the off-season, so, you know, reaching out to wish them a happy birthday. If you know they had something going on, just you know, gently saying, we're here if you need anything, and just not really forgetting about them during the off-season, making sure that they know that you're thinking of them. That's a very good point. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I always liked my Christmas card from my seasonal job. <laughs> um, so uh, I actually have another question directly for Carly, um, it, it, it's, it will go for all of you as well. But um, I'm wondering, Carly, how many businesses and employees does your organization work with, to, on average, I guess? Sure. Um, we currently have over 300 employers in the portal. And then we just reached 42,000 workers. And that's American and international workers. So if you do H2Bs or J1s, um, they're in there. They're, they're the vast majority, I would say. Um, as well as the American season, seasonal workers. And then um, for the for the 300 plus businesses, it's hospitality and tourism focused. Um, so it's really uh, ski resorts, lodging, private clubs, um, and then a few others as well. Okay. And for uh, my other three here, how many seasonal employees does or did your business uh, employ? And I know that uh, Jenny, you did kind of touch on 850 or 900. Yeah, I can yeah, I can jump right back in with that. Like mm -hmm. I said, we are traditionally a winter uh, sports resort. Um, ideally, 900 is our goal. That's a mix of season, of full-time and part-time workers. Um, we got as close to that as we've been uh, since pre-pandemic just last year, so we're hoping to hit that mark again, but it's all going to start in the next few weeks. And when that first flake of snow appears, the applications will just come pouring in. Um, but in the summer, we used to dip down, you know, to maybe around 150 or 200. We have a nationally ranked golf course, which is great. Uh, we were dipping into the conference business, so we were trying to get some summer action. This past year, we had 330 employees because we finally have. We're in there. We're, we've got mountain biking. Uh, we're a wedding destination. That's been huge in the last few years. We're a conference destination. Um, we're putting in a mountain bike park for this coming summer, so it's it'll be busy. We used to have big shoulder seasons, April and May, maybe October and November, and those just get narrower and narrower, which is great. But it is kind of crazy because it's a moving target all the time for us. Um, our properties, it depends on the property. There's some where we're hiring 40 people. There's some where we're hiring 200, so it really depends on which property. Um, some of them are year-round, but most of them are seasonal. Um, and I would say we probably have returning 50 to 65 percent seasonal, and then we have to hire for the rest. Good stat. Uh, much smaller. Uh, so anywhere between seven and nine seasonal. And then we would um, have anywhere between um, seven to up to 14 apprentices over the course of a summer as well. So those would be rotating um, shorter term um, situations. So I just want to point out, I think it's really great that we have such a range of business sizes here. So depending on what your business is, um, you can gain information across the gamut here. Um, 
so my next question uh, for all of you, what kind of programs or initiatives or offerings uh, did your, your company provide to employees in order to retain them uh, every year, to, to bring them back? Mm -hmm. Andy, you want to start? Sure, yeah. <laughs> We, we did um, institute a number of um, what we thought were attractive um, incentives. None of that was what our people wanted. So except for, I mean, anybody who was coming back got a raise. So that's attractive. Um, but other than that, like we instituted um, a simple um, IRA um, retirement program zero interest, not even a little bit attractive. And I only used that as, the, so then what I started to do was use that as a, 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 a springboard for the conversation because they're so young, they just couldn't have, they didn't have any conceptualization of what that even was almost. So I just started the conversation about this is the kind of investing that you could do and you can start now. And I don't, you know, hopefully as they went off into the, you know, into further adulthood, um, there's something about that that stuck. Um, and then the other thing that we talked a lot about was <clears throat> offering, one of the reasons, many reasons that we had apprentices in our, on our team was so that we could give our returning um, crew members more leadership, so that we could give them more autonomy, things that they owned, um, leadership opportunities and ways to learn while we're right also there. Because even our crew members were, so our apprentices were often younger than our crew members, but our crew members are also pretty young. Um, but I'm not sure that any of that really, I don't, I don't know that any of that was actually what got them coming back. I think it was the love of what it was that we did and the team that we created um, while we were on board. So I'm actually going to jump in here because... Um, From personal experience? Yes. So um, <laughs> to give you a little bit of personal information about me, I actually first came to Maine to work for Annie. <laughs> uh, she was my very first job here in Maine. I'm actually originally from Dallas, Texas, mm -hmm. and I had heard about these schooners up on the mid coast, and I thought that is the coolest thing I've ever heard. I didn't know you could actually do that as a job, and I got on a plane. I didn't know anyone, and then I met them, and I worked for them. I was a seasonal returnee five years. I returned for five years until I couldn't get any higher, like. She was the chef, and I, I couldn't be the chef. So, but then I went to another schooner right next door, and I was the chef on that boat. So, there was a lot of. <laughs> and, it's you know, all right. Like there's a place. There's got to be a place for them to grow. At a certain yeah. point, there has to be. So in our, so I'd say in our business. Um, so since you're bringing that up, who, bringing in our up. business, it's really four to five years, and then they've got to go on. They have. They then we say it's time. You got to go. It's time to you. There's no more for, there's nothing we have to give you anymore, and there's no place for us to grow, for you to grow in within our organization. But I will say it, there were a couple things that Annie touched on that I wanted to, to point out. Number one, she was 100% correct. I remember the conversation about the IRA, and it was completely over my head. I was 21 <laughs> years old. I didn't know anything that she was talking about, but it opened up that conversation for me as someone who was young and in the industry um, and realizing, oh, I should probably start thinking about my future and you know, investing, et cetera. Um, but there were a couple of things also that the, the seasonal jobs that I've personally done, whether it was on the boat or working at a summer camp or whatever the case might be, that were very appealing to me as an employee. Number one, uh, I had a place to live. Um, I was provided housing and I was often provided food I mean, we're living on a boat. Mm -hmm. I can't get off the boat. I'm living there, I'm working there. It is my home um, during the season. And that was a really important thing for me. But also, the retention of coming back year to year, as Annie pointed out, I could only stay about five years because I learned pretty much everything I needed to know. And I was able then to advance into an even higher position, but for another company. So a lot of the appeal for me personally, and I think for a lot of returning employees, is that increased amount of experience and training. I never went to culinary school. 
I learned everything about cooking from her. A lot of the young people who go aboard and they are working on, you know, they're working on deck. They start off and they don't know what a halyard is. They don't know how to haul an egg. They don't know any of that. And after about five years, they've gotten all that sea time and they're able to progress into boat building or they're able to progress into getting their own captain's license and running their own vessel. So there's also that progression of skill and experience that I just wanted to exemplify. Um, I'm sorry, Kate. Go ahead. Yep, the good. question I'll repeat it uh, is what programs or initiatives did your company offer to employees, whether they were uh, overt or sort of under the surface um, <laughs> that were work used to retain them every year? Yeah, so we do um, higher education. Um, we support it. So if you want to go and learn about something in the off season, we'll help fund that. Um, we've partnered with some local community colleges that have hospitality and culinary programs. Um, and you know, when a couple of years ago, when you know people were paying for tuition when in state and under twenty five, we were helping with that. And now we go, what are your books? What's your uniform? What do, what do you need help with to get you the education? We'll help you with that in return come work with us. Um, and I think that that just shows a level of intent and care into the genuine, I want to see you be successful. I think that's really what we're trying to portray rather than a flashy item that they can get. Um, I think those kind of things get people in the door. Um, we have steep discounts at all of our um, properties. And again, I, people take advantage of it, they use it. I think it gets them in the door. And then I think they get to really truly learn about our business. And I think it's more important for the day-to-day -day interactions they have with their management team and their coworkers. I truly think that that is what retains people, not really the flashy you know, perks and things like that. Jenny? Yeah, I, I agree with what Annie and Kate both had to say. Um, and uh, we do try to do what we can for uh, tuition reimbursement. But another thing we do try to do with our perks is that it does get them in the door, but then they get working and they forget and they don't have time to use the perks. <laughs> so we budget time. If a team wants to take a lesson and get some rentals and go spend the afternoon on the hill, we encourage them to do that and we tell them to stay on the clock. It's a team event. It should be sponsored. It should be supported. You should get out there and do that. Um, we also try to get our managers on board with what we call the main benefits with the E on the end. We live in a beautiful location. Um, so get your teams off site, show them the, you know, non-motorized pathway that's really accessible and really beautiful and inc incredibly easy for anyone to use. Um, we have snow cats that take our team to the top where we have a restaurant. We have some of our other team members go and do that that have never been to the top of the mountain before. Um, so just letting people know that they're appreciated is huge and getting them to come back. Um, we also made employee housing happen. It had been a concern for a long time, um, but we were finally able to use the numbers of our employee engagement survey to say this is a need, this has been a need for X amount of years. And we had a great circumstance come up where a local hotel was for sale and our company did purchase it. So we now have employee housing and even the team members that aren't living in the housing, just like what that did for the morale. It made them feel like they've been heard, they've been seen, and now we're bringing in new team members and we have a place for them to stay. Um, so those other perks are really great. I'll just jump in there too. Um, I don't know this from Seasonal Connect, but I actually grew up on Cape Cod, Massachusetts. So um, I was a seasonal worker like you, Caroline. Um, and, you know, just what you were saying, Jenny, was allowing them to feel heard. And I know this isn't always possible, but I think what came allowed me to keep coming back was, um, you know, they asked for our input. They wanted to hear from us. They gave us a voice rather than just cycling us through and, and hiring. So I do think there's something to that. But it does seem like having a voice with seasonal work is, is as important for your year round or a little more important to bring them back. Absolutely. Because um, those who, they're there year round, um, they, they feel a bit more secure. Mm -hmm. um, so they don't necessarily need to express themselves or feel heard as completely as a seasonal employee. I agree. All right. Um, what challenges, if any, uh, did your company or does your company um, encounter when seasonal 
employees do return year to year, or are there any challenges? Um, and, and for Carly, it's sort of uh, tourism companies in general, but um, are there any challenges? And, and if so, what are they to having people return every single year? Carly, would you like to start? Sure. I mean, I think what we hear a lot is um, workers playing the wage game. So they may want to come back. They might really like it there. But if they're able to get a higher hourly wage, that can be a, have a huge impact. Um, also, housing. I think it's great that you guys have housing. Um, for the employers that we work with, I'd say about a third have housing. Um, so it's not the majority. And so that's something that... Um, you know, people really value and especially the international workers. I mean, that's kind of um, a non-starter for a lot of them. So I would say, um, you know, if there's not housing, I think that can be difficult for them to want to return if they're, you know, given an offer for a new company that has housing they can provide. Yeah, I can jump in. I, housing is, is still an issue. I think it's kind of always going to be an issue. Is with where we are, it's remote, so there's not a lot of opportunity um, some of the seasonal rentals are now being used otherwise and not available for our team members. So I, when I thought about a response to that, that was the first word that came up for sure. Um, but another challenge that we've started to face is that our seasonal workers want to stay. Um, maybe they're sick of the six months here, six months here, and they just want to stay through. Uh, we do have some full-time year-round positions, but not a lot. Uh, so when we get those workers that do want to stay, um, sometimes it can be tricky. Sometimes we do have a great fit and we will turn a seasonal job into a full-time year-round job to keep the right player, which is always nice. Uh, it's great that our company is flexible with that. Um, and then it's funny because we also have the flip side of that. We have people that work really hard all summer and they want to come and play at Sugarloaf and they don't want a full-time job. They want a season off, but they want the pass and to be in the area. So we've opened up a lot of our jobs to part-time availability just to be flexible to meet people where they are. Um, that challenge exists too with a lot of the retirees that are at Sugarloaf. There's a lot of people there that just don't want to work. So finding ways to entice them in, um, is something that we're constantly working toward. Um, and then, you know, we're a small Eastern ski resort. If people really are passionate about skiing, they're going to want to go out West. Um, so it's hard to compete with those bigger companies that exist elsewise, elsewhere. Sorry. Um, for us, I would definitely say housing, again, across the board, it's difficult. Um, we had one property that had a good amount of housing, and we could see that it clearly made a difference in our seasonal hiring. We had two other properties that had zero housing and had to compete with downtown Portland, um, and it was extremely difficult. Um, we did secure housing. It's about 20 minutes away, so now our next hiccup and our next challenge is we have a lot of people coming from out of state, and they're like, well, I don't have my car, so now it's trying to figure that little speed bump out now we have the housing but now they're 20 minutes away and how do we get them back and forth um, and so that's what we're gonna be working on this winter but when we did get our housing secured for those areas um, we noticed a difference in the applications of people who were looking for those jobs they were more professional seasonal people who they go I'm out in Utah and I'm coming to Maine for the summer and then I'm going back up to you know Aspen in the winter and um, it just, it was a big changing point for us for those properties. Um, I would say another challenge is making it feel like they have space to grow within the seasonal um, jobs because there's a lot of people who do want to come back year to year, but they go, I've been doing the same thing for three seasons. And, you know, my parents are asking me, you know, when am I getting my, you know, big girl, a big boy job or when am I, and it's, it's trying to explain to them that it can be that. Um, and, you know, figuring out ways creatively to make them feel like they are growing. Um, I had a conversation with someone, you know, this past season who was like, I want to be in a management position by next year, but, you know, I'm still doing this and I still want to come back for the season. And I go, okay, you've done it for two seasons. And now you're in charge of training these two people and you're going to document how you do it and you're going to show us the steps that you used. And I'm like, and then we can talk about it. You can put that on your resume. And now when someone calls me and asks, I said, yes, she was a fantastic trainer. She was in charge of training these skills and these aptitudes. And, you know, these were the results of it. And so just getting creative within individuals' needs and individuals' wants within those positions, I think, made a huge difference. Um, and the other big thing that I'm noticing, and it seems a little counterintuitive, 
Um, we're closing for our season next week, and I have been helping all of my staff write their resumes. Um, and then they go, I got this interview, and I go, all right, let's look at the website. What questions are you gonna ask them? What, what do you wanna know about this company? What do you think they're gonna ask you? And I'm taking an active role in guiding them to the next step. Um, and it seems a little counterintuitive, like why are you pushing them away so you know easily? And I think by doing that, it shows them that you truly care about their success. And I have had those employees that I do that with return season to season um, because that stress of that the clock is ticking. I got a month left. I got three weeks left. What am I going to do? They know that we're there to support them. We're going to help them find that next step. Um, and I think that that has been really huge in retaining them because they felt valued and they know that, you know, you want them to succeed. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes it, you know, it does bite you. And you know they go off and they find a year-round job, but those people I do find that you go, hey, I need someone called out or someone's yeah. on vacation for two weeks. Can you come in and just work those two weeks? They go, yeah, I'll be right there. Yeah. And so you have someone who's automatically trained, who knows the position, who can jump in. Um, we have a kitchen down in Scarborough that I would say 20% of the staff is part-time, and they're all people who went on and found a job that you know furthered their career, and they just come back and. There's someone who's there on Tuesday nights and someone who's there Saturday mornings. And we have five people who just fill in, but they know it. We don't have to train them um, and they get the job done. Um, and for them, the other great thing is that they bring this freshness to it. They're not the one that's been there for five or six days a week and they aren't involved in all the drama of what's going on or the inner workings. They come in and they're this breath of fresh air and they've got a great attitude and energy. Um, and so I think really being as flexible as you can be to their needs is is really changed um, our staffing levels. Yeah, I don't have any other challenges to add, but I do, I would codify um, in some ways what you just said, which is your alumni core. If you create a really wonderful team and that, those team members are no longer part of your inner circle, there's still a huge alumni core from which you can draw either for part-time or fill-in work or um, referrals, word of mouth, like what your alumni says about working with you matters, right? So that means what happens when they're with you matters, how they leave matters, what you're saying is how, even if they leave, how they leave matters, right? That they could be at a boat that's right next to you and you're still, like there's a, still a colleagueship and a relationship there, that's huge. Um, and then the other thing I'd say, this isn't a challenge I think is more of a benefit, um, is that sometimes <clears throat> it's harder, it's I think course correcting, if I could use a maritime term, um, when you have a team that's a long-term team is a little bit more like turning a really large ship, right? Sometimes those course corrections take a long time. Whereas when you have seasonal workers, even if they're returning, you have an opportunity to shift things up, to have conversations, to make really, um, it's easier for everyone to make those course corrections. Okay, this year we found, we listened to you guys, we're gonna do it differently this year, or the feedback from our guests was X, Y, Z. So now we've implemented you know, these things. And as they come back in, it's just easier to adopt whatever that new thing is rather than ah, we always done it the other way and ah, I don't wanna do it a different way kind of thing. It takes a longer time. That's what we found. Thank you. Uh, Kate, you brought up a really wonderful uh, point that I wanted to expand on with the rest of you. Um, you mentioned the perception of seasonal jobs and how it's not a grown-up job, it's not the adult job, but then you also brought up these uh, professional seasonal workers who've gotten into a rhythm um, where in the summer they're in one place and in the winter they're in another. And I'm wondering uh, from all of you, um, how, how have you addressed that, I'm gonna say misconception about working in the seasonal realm um, as a, something that you do until you get your, your real world job? Carly, you wanna start? Sure, I mean, I think it's definitely a misconception. Um, because we don't see it that often, right? But for the people, I think it's really talking about the people that do it and kind of pointing to them and saying, you know, there are people that do this and make it work. And um, 
you know, this can be your norm if you want it to be. I also think it helps that um, through the pandemic, a lot of people, you know, really saw that they had an opportunity to make a change and, you know, it started to become a trend, especially with the younger generation of moving around, having a more mobile um, lifestyle. And so trying to capture those people um, who kind of seek out the year round travel and um, could have those jobs, you know, longer term or return season after season. Yeah, this is a tough question because if I tell people that I work at a ski resort, I think a very clear picture comes first and they don't understand that I work in human resources at a ski resort. So it, it it's, I think, a constant battle to kind of share that, you know, some people really do have real jobs at this resort and sometimes <laughs> being a lift operator is a very real job. Um, so I think for us, it's it's maybe as much as the people put into it and it's what they want to take from it. Um, we do have managers uh, that are in charge of full outlets that are only there from November to April. Um, so making sure that the team knows who they are um, so that if the manager of our outdoor center asks the retail company or our retail division for something, people know who she is and they recognize that she's probably asking because she really needs it really fast. Um, so when we do promote or move people, we make sure that the title matters to them. Um, we give them the title that they want and we make sure that people know that that's what their title is. Um, that's been really big lately with a lot of our promotions is that title piece. And we're not stuck in a traditional fashion of you'll have this job, then this job, then this job. If someone has a strength in something else, we will make them the communications and marketing coordinator, even though people see them as the snow reporter. It's really more to it. There's more to their job and we let people know that there's more to their job. Um, and then I think with that training, we do provide on the job training, um, either with their direct report or with a larger group of colleagues, whatever it may be. So I think that inviting those people that now maybe have the real job they've always wanted to a training session, that's huge for them to be a part of a group that has other departments represented and their voice again is heard there too. Um, I think just to follow on that, I think keeping it simple and just honoring and respecting every level and every position um, and the kitchen, I think everyone pictures, you know, dishwasher as, um, you know, someone whose job really isn't that important or no one really, they don't care about it. But the truth of the matter is that a dishwasher is like, they are the key person in the kitchen and they are the one that makes it run and they're the one that makes it run successfully. And so I think um, like, teaching people to respect and educate them on the fact that like every position is important in the work that's happening and in the daily functions. Um, so I think if they come in with that stigma, it's retraining them that like, no, that's actually the most important person in the kitchen. And like that person deserves all the respect as much as the executive chef. Um, so I think it's just kind of retraining them when they come in. Yeah, and I think also supporting them when they get that feedback from their um, family members and or from, like in our case, from guests themselves, you know, as the guests are starting to learn about crew members. All right, so you're going to do this for a couple of years, but then literally, so when, it, like, what's your, what are you thinking about for a real job? And the internal, you know, whenever I would hear that, I would always say, actually, <laughs> you know, in some way, some fashion or another, the person was up at 5.30 in the morning and went to bed at 9.30. Felt pretty real to them, yeah. <laughs> all working all day long. So it's the, I think that perception of, well, the one, hospitality industry, but also secondly, the, um, if you're not doing a job that's connected to the education that you had, that then gets you the pay, that gets you the housing, that gets you like all the trappings. But I think that the, I think the generations coming up are not feeling that same kind of stigma. I mm -hmm. think they're starting to um, really push against that traditional stigma of what a, an actual real job looks like or what real housing looks like even, mm -hmm. right? I mean, mm -hmm. as, as the housing industry in Maine and across the country is more and more challenging. I think our younger generations, if you don't already have a house, I think reimagining what housing looks like for our younger generation still having a real job um, is 
is huge. I think it's critical. They're not, I don't think that the same kind of pathway is going to be, you know, available to them as it was for different generations preceding them. And I just want to make a comment to actually hook onto that. I, I personally feel that um, social media in particular has really opened up the different types of opportunities, whether it's career, uh, whether it's housing, the, the sort of trappings, as you said, um, those are becoming much broader in opportunity and availability. And people are becoming much more accepting um, and then embracing of these new experiences and availabilities. Um, and I also wanted to point one thing out. Um, so again, through tourism for me, we go and we talk to students, um, but we also talk to a lot of adults, uh, teachers, parents, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the things that um, I wanted to comment on was the whole concept of entry level, entry level worker, right? And how, again, they f parents in particular, they feel like, oh, that's not a real job. That's not the big girl job uh, or whatever. And what we have actually begun doing through our talks to students, but also in our recommendations to business owners is to sort of shift our semantics and go with a foundational position. This is a foundational job. You are learning the core pieces that you need in order to move into uh, a managerial position or an ownership position. Um, we talk to students all the time. You know, they say, oh, well, pff, I'm not going to go and work at the pizza shop. That's stupid. I'm not making any money there or it's beneath me or whatever the case might be. Um, and we say, well, you might like to bake all day long, but if you can't run a business, you aren't going to open a bakery, right? And so sort of reiterating that those foundational positions are as valuable like the dishwashing positions. They are as valuable, if not more valuable, because they keep things moving. They keep the business uh, going as needed um, and help it and the young person. Or honestly, we have people who are re-entering the workforce as retirees. We have people who are uh, maybe they've retired from the military and they're looking for something else. So again, going with the foundational position as opposed to the entry level, um, it also makes those who are entering those jobs um, feel more confident about taking a chance on something that they haven't necessarily done before. Um, I also, sorry, I, I have my notes from everyone talking. I wrote them on my hand. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I can write these down. Um, I also wanted to bring up uh, how training um, Kate was talking about training and how, I'm, I'm sorry, both Jenny and Kate were talking about training and how it helps to retain their, their workers. But I also really loved how Kate brought up, she will help them write their resume. She will help them with a letter of recommendation, whatever the case might be, because those training skills um, that they're gaining are going to show that there is care and there is um, uh, an appreciation for what you did while you were here in order to help you advance, but then also to say, you know what, we really like you. We'd like you to come back. And if you want to go off and learn something somewhere else and then come back, we're, we're all for that too. So I think those programs as well um, are really fantastic. Sorry, that's my little two cents. I do have another question for you guys. <laughs> um, Sorry, notes. Um, Jenny mentioned uh, that sometimes it's difficult to find someone who just wants to be there for a certain amount of time. I personally have met uh, a man who works between two different companies. And he works at Sugarloaf as ski patrol for part of the year. And the rest of the year, he actually works at a whitewater rafting um, business. And he is their um, operations manager there. And I was curious if any of you have explored or if you already integrate any partnerships with other businesses that also are seasonal um, to sort of trade your employees back and forth and therefore kind of 
fill the gaps for each other. Yeah, I can jump in with that exact example. Uh, whitewater rafting companies are some of our best friends. Uh, some of them do retain their employees through the winter, but for the most part, they have a group of very hardworking, very capable, and very adventurous people that are looking for winter placement. So we partner with many of the whitewater rafting companies just in that way. Most of our team member retention is actually in that business as well. Um, so that's a huge one for us. We have branched out and we've built some partnerships in Bar Harbor as well because it's it's the same kind of idea. Um, we're working with anyone. I know Jessica from Sunday Rivers here too. They definitely partner with other creative partnerships where the summer is their busiest business and then they come to them in the winter. Um, so some of those do just kind of develop naturally. Some we seek out. Um, we do a lot to encourage, just like Kate was saying, that summer employment. And we've actually started hosting a job fair um, in February or March because we're looking for summer employees, but these other places are also looking for summer employees. So just like helping them with their resume feels like it's counterintuitive, it's super helpful. So we invite those partners to come and be a part of our job fair, take our employees but just for the summer. <laughs> <laughs> let's not get carried away. Yeah, let's not get crazy. <laughs> yeah. we have a, we have a oh, no, no question. I was saying sign me up. I'm coming. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we will have time. But continue. I'll say, too, um, for Seasonal Connect, that is really the core of what we do is helping employers find partners. And I think Maine is one of those unique states that has both seasons, which is really special. Um, and just to go back to kind of changing the narrative of this being, you know, not just an entry level position, but something people can do as a career. I think when you have both seasons in the same area for the people that don't want to move across the country or do want to have children or um, have concerns about that, it makes it more possible for them to make this a career if they can commute for the winter season and commute for the summer and can have their home stay in the same place year round. Um, so we see a lot of that, especially with, um, Americans going back and forth. If you have a season, um, if you have both seasons in the area, it's more likely that they'll, they'll want to do this as a career, um, rather than going, you know, from Maine to Arizona or South Florida. Um, we also partner with, um, ski resorts and we have people that go back and forth, um, season to season. And then the other thing that, um, we have, uh, worked with is, um, summer camps, um, and that's because uh, a lot of our staff is college age and come late August, early September, they all go back to college and all of a sudden we are incredibly short staffed and we only have two more months and you're like, how do you hire for two more months? And it becomes a very big problem. Um, and we realize that a lot of summer camps, um, they're ending in August and that staff still wants to hang out in Maine or they are professional seasonal people and they're like, my other, my other job doesn't start until November or December. Um, and so we have um, built relationships with summer camps. And when the camp closes, uh, we've had a lot of their staff come and join us just for the last two months of the season. And they're happy to do it and we're happy to have them. So it's worked out as a really great relationship. Yeah, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we didn't, I mean, most of our work was focused on um, retaining folks so that we didn't find that we needed um, to partner. We're looking for a much, oopsie, sorry, much smaller pool, you know? So the word of mouth um, piece really served us more than anything. Although I will point out, personal, um, <laughs> <laughs> the businesses that you created relationships were often uh, places for What's employees to go. Um, I know there was a yarn store that worked very closely and I know that employees would shift from working on the boat and then in the winter That's season they would work at the yarn store yeah. um, that they had done specialized cruises with. Right, so what you're saying is our um, either vendor and or business B2B relationships ended up being um, a resource for our crew employees. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. Um, I'm very curious from all of you, would you say that it is more effective to retain seasonal employees from year to year, or if not, or if so, 
why, and if not, um, what, were, what were your reasons why it was not so great? I'd say 100%. I mean, it's just like trying to find the new person to come on the boat as, as opposed to um, investing in that relationship. Always finding the new person is way, the new guest is way harder. I think the same thing is true of um, new employees. And <clears throat> then you have that institutional memory. What we tried to do was it um, not lead, not have everyone um, go at once mm -hmm. so that there's this um, institutional memory and kind of overlap that just kept weaving. You know, that's how we do things. That, uh, we didn't realize until that happened for the first time that we actually we actually have a culture and it was very difficult. It's With seasonal employees, you have a very short period of time to ramp up to get that culture. Although this is how we do things. This is like all of those, un, those soft, un, almost unspoken. You can put stuff down on paper, but it's all the other like softer ways of this is how we speak to each other. This is how we, this is how we manage conflict. This is how we, but this is what our rhythm is like, that kind of thing. Um, I would okay, I would say ahead. the obvious yes and no. Um, I when we have opportunities where we have a large amount of returning seasonal staff, um, in my department I'll take that opportunity to start building new systems. Something that I was thinking about. I've always wanted to do this for like three or four seasons, but there's never enough time. I'm training. I take those opportunities when I have a ton of returning staff to build systems and bring in new ideas and change up what we're doing a little bit because I have the time and the freedom because. I'm not training and these people can just jump in and they know what they're doing. Um, and then, you know, the times when I don't have returning seasonal staff or the same amount of returning seasonal staff. Now I have these awesome systems and these things built in place to help train these new people up and to bring them up to speed faster. Um, I will say that it's so much nicer for managers to have returning staff. Mm -hmm. um, but I will say the best thing about new staff is this year I had someone come in who was brand new to, um, baking and we're like we're going to take you under our wing and we're going to show you how to do things and we were in the kitchen and she goes why are you doing it that way couldn't you just do this and I was just like everybody I am so embarrassed we didn't even think of this like we're not talking about this again this is the new way we do it <laughs> and we've done it this way like, forever I promise like and it's just you get like a new perspective so I think uh having a little bit of both is actually a pretty good thing I agree with Kate um my knee-jerk reaction to this question was absolutely of course it's effective to retain employees but then when you think on it longer you think of the ones you want to have back and I think that's just a business model anywhere yeah. um, we take part in this leadership training that talks about how you have your A, your B and your C players and the encouragement is to share your C players with the comp competition <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's very true because one bad player can affect the whole team yes. and if a manager is brave and bold enough to say we are so short staffed, but I am not bringing that person back to right. this team, the rest of the team will just be like, yes, thank yeah. you. Because um, they see it. People are spending so much time at work. They see it. And I think making those moves is really important. The big, big picture, absolutely. Bringing the team back is great. Um, but letting some go isn't the worst. Um, and our team has learned to do more with less people. Um, you can be a more effective and fluid team if you work effectively. Um, and then the other piece too, like Kay was saying, that new perspective is great. Um, we have team members that do leave and they maybe do go out west, but then they come back with a new perspective and a new appreciation for Sugarloaf and new ideas from where they went. So for the most part, absolutely, it's, it's effective, but it does help in those instances to get some fresh ideas. I can only echo what everyone else said, but um, essentially I think it is a yes and a no. I think allowing or having people that can train the new seasonal workers is huge. Um, I think we all know that training takes a lot of time. <laughs> and so that's helpful. Um, I love that you mentioned though, that we all think of the people we want to return because I, that didn't really occur to me, but right. it's such a great point. Um, and if you have a bad apple, it really can affect the rest of your, your staff and then you're not retaining them sometimes too. So, yeah. I mean, the returning isn't a given, you know, mm -hmm. Like it's a it's an opportunity to either if you need if need be to re-interview people or to make course corrections. But also there have been a number of times when I've said, so what would be different? Like how would you know you want to come back? But I'm not I'm just not clear on how it would go differently and well. Mm -hmm. 
I don't think this is the best opportunity for you. I, 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 don't, I didn't witness you happy doing your work. Okay. Why would we repeat that? Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, what recommendations uh, would you make to other businesses in our audience or for other businesses in your realm of the industry, whether it's outdoor rec, whether it's lodging, uh, what, whatever the case might be, um, what recommendations might you make to other businesses on how they can retain employees from year to year? I think what we hear most often is presenting an offer and um, if they want to come back and having that signed offer during the current season before they leave. Um, so having that conversation ahead of time, being ready for um, the offer, making it, and having that kind of understood and agreed to and accepted before they even leave your organization to go to their next opposite season point. adventure. Yeah, that's great advice. I was just making sure to mental note that for us. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I had a bunch. I think communication, it's just some of the key pieces that are always important, but for us, um, we need to make sure that our employees know that they are the reason our business is successful. Um, and I think in the last few years, we've seen that more than any. If, if uh, they don't show up, we can't run a lift. If we don't have enough team members, we can't open a restaurant. Um, so if we really build that family and that team so that everybody relies on each other and they truly do feel like if I don't get to work or find someone to take my shift, I'm letting them down, not I'm missing my wages, but that it, the team only works when the team is there. Um, and making sure that everybody knows that they're a part of us being successful. Um, I think one thing that we hit on really strongly is at first impressions is our onboarding of our staff. We make sure that our onboarding is really robust and that they know exactly what their expectations are. Um, and then we can learn um, you know, what they want from us and what we want from them um, and build upon that. And then I think it also helps erase any anxieties of you know, starting a new job. And then that next season, they remember, oh, I know exactly what I'm going to do. They're going to take care of me. They're going to show me the whole way. I can just go right back to that, and it'll be just fine. So I think building something that's comfortable and letting them know that they're a part of the culture um, and then staying true and genuine to that the whole season. And like I said, like you know, helping with resumes, helping them find that next job. Um, and then we have touch points in the wintertime. We have a seasonal party. We send out newsletters to any staff that had worked there in the past previous five years that just go, hey, this is what we've been working on over the winter, and this is what we're doing that's going to be better. And, you know, just having those points of communication throughout the year, um, I think is definitely helpful. Yeah, I don't, it, good job. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have anything else to add. I think the appreciation that Kate mentioned, too, is huge. It feels like not much to put someone's face on your Instagram or Facebook page, but it means a lot. Mm. Uh, we have a team member Facebook group that we typically only you know, invite team members to be a part of, but as soon as we put someone on it, their parents are asking to be a part of their group, their grandmother's asking to be a part of the group, and we're like, yep, everybody, let's go, that's great. One point that I actually would like to bring up, again, as we've been going around and talking to students um, and their parents and teachers and et cetera, et cetera, one of the things that I've noticed very commonly now is that a job or a career path, you almost have to sell it to the potential employee in the same way that you would sell your business to a potential customer or a guest. Um, it needs to be appealing. It needs to have those perks visible, whether it's through really cool short form videos or for, through posters or even a listing of the benefits that are there, whether they're traditional benefits or not, which is essentially our next panel in this room, just so you know. Um, but creating that allure to the job position um, and also opening up opportunities to interns and apprentices to create that potential new pool of either alums or seasonal workers um, to bring people back as much as possible. Um, we're seeing that being very effective in talking to students um, and, and in the educational realm, that's what a lot of them are looking for, for their students and for, for their, their young ones as they enter into the workforce. Um, does anyone on our panel have anything else that they would like to say that I didn't 
cover didn't ask about. Anything? That's all right. I don't think so. Yeah. Well, then I'm going to open up the floor for questions. Does anyone have any questions? I do have a mic right here. Go for it. Okay. I have a question. I have like a grandmother question here <laughs> from another generation <laughs> who's living on Social Security and long-term investments, so you know, keep on preaching that. <laughs> so Retirees and veterans aside, for professional seasonal staff, what do they do for health insurance? Mm. I know they probably think they're never going to need it, but that's what insurance is all about. What do you do for health insurance? What do they do? Would anyone like to start? I, I can, we, um, we, do, we have a new benefit in our Boyne Resort program where if someone is in their third season with us, whether it's you know winter, 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 or winter, summer, winter, they do qualify for um, medical benefits for themselves. So we do have, we call it a full-time seasonal benefited um, category. So it's a new status. Um, it's tricky. It doesn't work for everybody because it's only going to cover them while they're with us. Um, but what we do try to do is help them navigate switching between other providers and that provider. So we use our benefit partner to help those team members navigate the marketplace or whatever it may be. Um, and it has really worked for some of our team members for sure, but we also open that assistance up to everybody. Even if you're a full-time seasonal worker and you work on the rafting, or you work with the rafting companies, but you just turned 26 and your parents told you it's time, um, <laughs> we'll connect them with our Acadia Benefits partner so that they can help get some navigation for a very complicated process. And incidentally, um, with that, you, uh, you said, Three seasons are those consecutive seasons? Oh, that's so it's not like you could do one winter and then two years down the line another winter and then five years down the line. Yeah, another I I think that's how it reads is that it's either your three winters in a row or your three seasons in a row or Got your it. three summers in a row, whatever it may be. It was it was an attempt at something different. I think for some people it really did work. It definitely wasn't the answer, but it was it was something. It was it was good yeah. to try. Anyone else? We also, um, we're hearing more about just seasonal benefits in general. Um, we have a friend, she works for Health Benefit Alliance, I want to say, and they do seasonal um, benefits, and it's alongside your regular um, medical plan and carrier. So, um, you know, you may have medical benefits for your full-time employees, but they help with part-time and seasonal. So that's becoming more common. Um, and, you know, my concern was, oh, you're competing with, the other carriers, but she was saying that they, they really supplement for the workers that don't qualify for the full-time benefits. What's the name again? It was Health Benefit Alliance. You're welcome. Anyone else? Oh, oh uh, I just, is that a question? Hang on one second, Nigel. I wanted to point out uh, one other thing about working on the boats, or if you're working in a position um, where you're just always there, um, a lot of your health issues maybe you know if you it's not necessarily going to cover oh I have to go to the doctor but if you do have an injury or something on uh, the the boat um, you are covered by those experiences so that can also be uh, helpful and I'm speaking from experience because I <laughs> did take a fall on the boat once um, and it was covered by the employer it's a good question though because we didn't. We never felt like we fully sorted that answer out. And uh, again, with our age group, there was a lot of cavalier. Ah, it's fine. I don't. Need, you know, I'm not going to need it. It's fine. But yeah. Yep. And many people are covered up to. Yeah. You know, they're they're covered to 26. Um, so it it is a less less of an issue for that younger crowd. But once you hit 26, 27, <laughs> then it uh, it does change the narrative. Nigel, you have a question. Does anybody in more of a fixed business, not you know seasonal, um, offer bonuses, retention bonus at the end of the season? I didn't hear that mentioned. Anybody offer childcare? Because that's a big issue for seasonal people. Um, the other question, and this again is of a more a business like a restaurant or a hotel. 
in a couple of the businesses I ran, we offered a percentage of the upsell. So the guest is coming for three days at $100 a night. They made a reservation of $300. And if they spent extra, you know, on optional trips or, you know, zip line trips or, or skiing or they rented skis, then the employees within that department would get a percentage of the upsell. And in the restaurant, the way we were trained, we put a dessert trolley in front of the guests <laughs> just when they fit near the end of the main course, and it always upsold, and you got a percentage of that. You know, I find that a percentage upsell through the season does help. And then the last one, I you know, I heard the idea about partnering within within Maine with you know white water rafting and pulling thing, but also partnering with other tourism partners in Florida because of the opposite seasons. Um, in a, one company we did that and it worked reasonably well, you know, depending. But again, I think the idea of getting a signed, a signed agreement to come back is very important because, you know, when you're dealing with somebody in Florida, you never know. Florida's a great place to live if you're an orange. <laughs> <laughs> Those are all excellent points. Um, I hadn't thought about childcare or the percentage of the upsell, so I think those are fantastic tips. Um, we hear a lot from our employers about retention bonuses, and I'll say since the pandemic, they skyrocketed. Um, just any bonus in general really yeah. skyrocketed because everybody's trying to do anything they can to encourage people to come back. I'd be curious about what the bonuses look like. More, maybe more specifically than just a bonus. I'm just curious what other people are doing. I can speak on that, and it was kind of pandemic-related. Um, we wanted to instill what we were going to call a service and loyalty bonus, and it would be based on certain factors, like if your department scored a certain number on our annual audit, and if you fulfilled your work commitment, we would give you this bonus. And I think the more we thought about it, the more like, why are we doing that? We're just going to give a bonus. <laughs> so we just give a 5% loyalty bonus each season. Um, so in April, we pay out a 5% bonus on gross earnings from November to April. And in October, we do the same from May to October. Um, and that made it much more clear. If you're a part-time worker and you just work, you know, four hours here and there whenever you can, you're still going to get a bonus because it's a 5% bonus. It's not based on if you worked X amount of hours. Um, so that was super helpful. Um, and the team really, really appreciated that. Yeah. Um, and then just on the, the child care piece, we luck out. We have ski lessons, so any of our team members can bring their children to join a ski group. Um, so we don't necessarily provide child care as a benefit, but it is this nice side action that we have going on that keeps everybody pretty happy. Uh, we also have something similar to that where we one of our um, resorts has child care on site, and there have definitely been those pinch hit moments when someone's like, my babysitter or my, you know, whatever, can I bring my child with me? And yeah, okay. And, you know, we'll definitely make that work. Um, and we also do a, it isn't retention for the following season, but it's retention for the whole season. Um, in the beginning of the year, when you say, yes, I want to start, um, we say, here's your start date. When can you work until, is it till the end of the season? We need an exact date. Um, and let's say they say, okay, I can work all the way through October 31st. If you stay that entire time that you said you were going to work on your offer letter, uh, we give you 7% of your total earnings over your season. Mm -hmm. And that is, you know, that's the kind of carrot at the end of the stick. Um, and there, we do have people that go, oh, sorry, I found another job. And you go, okay, well, you know, that's your choice if you want to give that up or not. But it has been uh, very effective in keeping our staff you know, from, you know, straying in those last couple months when they yeah. might find something else, but, you know, trying to weigh their options, it's definitely helped retain them for the entire season. Just, just, one <laughs> just one more point about, somebody asked about the bonus specifics. A car rental company my son worked for in 2019 before the pandemic, if he started on June the 1st, as I think university gets out at the end of May in this country, mm -hmm. And he stayed till August the 20th. Uh, the car rental company gave him $800. Mm -hmm. and yeah. All right. We, oh, we do have one more question? Okay. This is uh, retention from a slightly different perspective. Um, I had some issues this year with people uh, coming, training, filling out their paperwork, and then they disappear. Yep. 
it, it, it's very bizarre, you know. I, I, I don't know why you do all that work and not show up. <laughs> yeah, I don't. Yeah, exactly. So is this something that it sounds like other people are seeing the same kind of behavior because it was not something I'd ever we seen. We talked about that this morning. <laughs> okay. Like, why would you? It's not you. It's not mm -hmm. personal. No. I I just stopped dwelling. Yeah. <laughs> it yeah. just got it. It's very odd. And I don't know. Yeah. To your welcome email or haven't given you their travel arrangements or things you're asking for. They're not commenting. That's no, they're nice. here. Yeah. They're training in my site oh. and have filled out all their paperwork and then I never see them oh, <laughs> and don't answer my phone calls and don't a little some of it's tricky too our, our hiring managers have seen some similar pieces and I think one question that we really need to start outlining and asking is what's the best way to get in touch with you because yeah. for some people email is just the thing that builds up and they yeah. never check text mm -hmm. is best Facebook Messenger, there's all these different platforms, yeah. but if you know the, how you get that one person, it might help, might not, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> all right, well, thank you all for joining us for this second panel here. Uh, at this point, it is now lunch. I'm sure you all are all very famished. Um, it is in the Casco Bay room right over here where we had our breakfast. And uh, during that time, we're going to have our keynote speaker, Dr. Richard Curry uh, from Boston University come and speak about what do employees really want, identifying which factors turn hospitality and tourism jobs into careers. So if you feel free, you can go through the hotel or you can go out right through this door back here and cross the little garden up through the pergola and uh, head right on in.